We have a bunch of new information on Game Boy Advance games for you coming up in this episode, but we're going to kick things off with some newly translated details about the Game Boy Advance itself. These details come from a great interview we had translated from 64 Dreams' April 2001 issue. Taking part in the interview are three men who were essential to the Game Boy Advance's design and development. Satoru Okada, Kenichi Sugino, and Ryuji Umezu. Okada in particular is a true Nintendo OG. He had a hand in creating the Game & Watch, Game Boy, and every other Nintendo handheld up to the DSi XL before he retired in 2012. Okada begins by saying Nintendo had been, quote, experimenting with colorization constantly since 1994. Right off the bat, this is pretty interesting. Development on the Game Boy Color started in 1996, but Okada says Nintendo was testing the waters a whole two years earlier, and we think we know what he's alluding to. The time frame of those experiments lines up with the development of Project Atlantis, a failed Game Boy successor that allegedly boasted a 32-bit ARM microprocessor half a decade before the Game Boy Advance. Rumors about Atlantis first sprung up in 1996, but besides one or two confirmations, it was basically all hearsay. That was until 2009's Game Developers Conference. At that year's GDC, Nintendo's Masato Kuwahara spoke about his time leading development on the DSi, and showed off some prototypes. One of them was this. It was Atlantis. Kuwahara gave us photo evidence that it was real and existed circa 1995, Though, thanks to Okada, we know development started on it in 1994. So those Atlantis rumors in 1996 got the name right, but what about that 32-bit ARM processor that they mentioned? And why was Atlantis scrapped? Over the years, people have speculated that it was too bulky, or that it had poor battery life. And if Nintendo's PR is to be believed, it's because the Game Boy was doing great, and they didn't want to cannibalize their own hardware sales. But we think we might have stumbled upon the real reason it was canned. Money. And it has something to do with those 32-bit ARM processor rumors. In June 2019, the Talks at Google YouTube channel uploaded a discussion with Dave Jagger, a hardware designer who worked at ARM for over a decade starting in 1991. In the interview, Dave states that he was talking to and visiting Nintendo in 1994, a time frame that matches up with those magazine rumors. This was just after ARM unleashed ARM 7, which Dave actually led development on. The original ARM 700 was a 32-bit microprocessor that was benchmarking well, but it had a few issues that made it less than ideal for a handheld gaming system. The biggest problem relevant to games hardware was that it had poor code density. Let us explain. Initially, ARM 7 could only use the default ARM instruction set that's a 32-bit fixed-width instruction set. Every instruction then took up 32 bits, even simple instructions, leading to a fair amount of unoptimized and bloated code requiring a lot of storage space. This is problematic because if a game's total size grows to, say, 9 megabytes, and its data can't be cut or compressed any lower, instead of being published on an 8 megabyte cartridge, it would have to be put on a 16 meg cart. This is because computer storage grows most efficiently by doubling going from 1 bit to 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. So if you're a company like Nintendo, and low density code just bloated your game past the 8 meg mark, you now have to spend more money publishing it on a 16 megabyte cartridge. Since Nintendo was talking to Dave in 1994, it's clear they were interested in using an ARM processor in their hardware, and it gives merit to those Atlantis 32-bit ARM processor rumors from the 90s. We think this also makes it pretty clear that Atlantis was using ARM 7. And about 28 years ago, someone else thought so too. In Electronic Gaming Monthly's 83rd issue, one of their sources claimed that Atlantis used an ARM 710 processor. Next Generation magazine, on the other hand, claimed that Atlantis used a strong ARM SA110 processor, which came in 100, 160, and 200 MHz clock speeds. Even if Nintendo went with the weakest version of 100 MHz, that would have put Atlantis's CPU on par with the Nintendo 64's CPU. 
and frankly, a mid-90s gaming handheld rivaling the most powerful home console at the time sounds like, well, a load of old bollocks. It seems like EGM source was closer to the truth, but the ARM 710 wouldn't have resolved the code density issue, and Nintendo needed a processor that wasn't going to balloon their games and push them onto bigger, more expensive cartridges. While on a train in February 1994, Dave designed a 16-bit ARM architecture on a napkin, based on the architecture in his college thesis. He realized that ARM could have two instruction sets, the 32-bit set ARM already used, and a 16-bit set he named Thumb. Basically, Thumb's instructions are encoded into 16-bit as opposed to 32-bit, requiring half the bus width and occupying half the memory. And although some tasks would require more instructions to complete, overall, a program written in Thumb code took up just 70% of the space that it would in ARM code. This is exactly what Nintendo needed, as it meant games could be better optimized to fit on small ROM cartridges. And the first ARM CPU made that could use Thumb, the ARM 7 TDMI, is what made its way into the final Game Boy Advance. Dave goes over some other interesting tidbits in the interview, like how it's generally believed that Nokia commissioned development of the ARM 7 TDMI, because the Nokia 6110 used it a few years before the GBA released, but it was actually made for Nintendo. And that the NSA wanted to put a back door in the processor. Yeah, really. But that's about all Dave said. At least, that's about everything relevant to this video. So let's get back to that 64 Dream interview. The team wraps up their anecdotes about the Game Boy Color, bringing up how they were only given about a year to finalize its hardware. But even during this hectic time, and despite the failure of Atlantis, their minds wandered, contemplating a true successor to the Game Boy. Something more advanced. And the team would get their chance after work on the Color wrapped up. When designing the Game Boy Advance, one of the first details the team had to nail down was the screen size and aspect ratio. Kenichi Sugino says they could have just kept the screen the same size as the Game Boy Color, but that wouldn't have been impactful. They wanted the Game Boy Advance to have a sense of, it's gotten bigger and it's changed. But this wasn't the only reason. The Game Boy got tons of home console ports over the years, but their visuals were heavily compressed, and even worse, they were all cropped to fit the incredibly square Game Boy display. The Advance screen had to be wider. The Game Boy Advance screen ended up being closer to the 4x3 aspect ratio of most TV screens at the time, but even more comparable to the 16x9 aspect ratio of increasingly popular widescreen TVs. The team experimented with different button layouts and screen positions, starting out with some long designs, similar to the OG Game Boy. But the designs all ended up being too ugly or too big, and the size made it difficult to reach the L and R buttons on the shoulders. The team tried to fix the issue by moving L and R down to the back of the device, and even considered completely ignoring button layouts from past handhelds and trying something new. But Game Boy games had to be playable on the Game Boy Advance, so the button positions had to be at least somewhat similar. The team realized they had to switch to a horizontal layout to keep the design neat and compact, which also left the Game Boy button layout intact. After tinkering with two Game Boy Advance prototypes that used a smaller and a larger screen, then making some optimizations that reduced cost and improved battery life, they finally let game developers take it for a spin. But developers had a problem with it. It was too low in memory. And the team actually took the criticism on board. Ryuji Umizu said, In the end, what we made was a two-chip composition with the CPU and a separate two-megabit memory. That increased the cost, but also had a lot of advantageous side effects, like being able to download programs into the memory. This made it possible for four-player modes using only one cartridge. It also allowed us to connect to the GameCube, download data, and run it. We kept coming up with more and more ideas like that. Interestingly, the GameCube had a small influence on the Game Boy Advance's design, its color. Sugino says the reason they made the main Game Boy Advance color violet was to tie it in with the cube. He goes on to say, The GBA was displayed in silver at Space World because we didn't have the mold ready in time and had no choice but to paint over it to hide the surface treatment. 
We made over 40 different samples like red and yellow, but we really didn't want to use the same colors as previous Game Boys. With it being a new product, we wanted to release it in colors that hadn't been seen before. The GBA is a bit high priced and higher tech than before, so we wanted to give it more of an adult coloring. And that's why one of the launch colors is Arctic White. Now, behind the scenes info about Nintendo hardware development is always fascinating, but it's about time we looked at some actual games. First, we're going to take a quick look at a Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga tidbit we've never heard before. It comes from the December 2003 issue of Japan's Nintendo Online magazine, which has an interview with a few Alpha Dream developers about their work on Superstar Saga. We had it translated, but unfortunately it was mostly old news, except for this one bit of info. In the game's final cutscene, Toadsworth and Lady Lima share a friendly embrace after basically not interacting with each other for the entire game. According to the game's scenario writer and lead field designer Hiroyuki Kubata, he wanted these characters' relations to go beyond friendship. Kubata said, I like Lady Lima. She's got such a sharp tongue. If I had more leeway in development, I would have wanted to add in a romance between Lady Lima and Toadsworth. That could have been either very cute or very weird. Time to move on from Superstar Saga, but that's not the last of our Mario trivia. Another interview we had translated comes from the August 2001 issue of Nintendo Online Magazine. This one's all about Mario Kart Super Circuit, the GBA's best-selling title outside of Pokemon Generation 3. The previous Mario Karts were both made in-house at Nintendo EAD, but Super Circuit's development would fall to longtime Nintendo partner Intelligent Systems. So this interview gathers Intelligent Systems Takeshi Ando and Yukio Morimoto, who co-directed Super Circuit, as well as programmer Kenji Matsumoto and Nintendo's Hiroyuki Kimura, one of the guys who oversaw development and gave feedback. And these four divulge some pretty interesting details about how Super Circuit came to be. Hiroyuki Kimura kicks things off by saying that when the team first learned about the GBA's actual hardware, they thought about how the hardware might perform, and Mario Kart seemed like a good fit. Nintendo's past handhelds lacked the power to deliver a satisfying Mario Kart experience, but they could pull it off on GBA, and even have four players at once. When the team began testing their ideas, they started porting over Super Mario Kart from the SNES and incorporated some elements from Mario Kart 64. Things developed quickly from here. Kenji Matsumoto mentions how time-consuming it was to make tracks early on, with the team barely scraping three courses together for Space World 2000. The game was first revealed here as Mario Kart Advance, a name Nintendo decided to keep for its Japanese release. But it seems scarcity turned into surplus, with Matsumoto saying that after Space World, we created a tool that made things faster. We actually made a lot of other courses that didn't make it into the final product. Then Kimura chimes in, revealing something pretty interesting. At first we had courses under the sea as well, but Miyamoto said no to them. He said carts don't work underwater. Despite Miyamoto's initial resistance to underwater karting, the series would eventually embrace the idea a decade later in Mario Kart 7. To make the courses, Morimoto would draw them out on paper, then have a graphic designer create a test map. His designs were random at first and didn't factor in how the carts handled, but he got a feel for drawing more interesting curves that better fit the game as development went on. All in all, the game's tracks would be reworked five to ten times to get them just right. Interestingly, Morimoto seems to say the team made the course graphics first, like backgrounds and floor tiles, then made the courses after. The team soon realized that a handheld Mario Kart would have some unique differences to its console cousins. While multiplayer in Super Mario Kart and Mario Kart 64 used split-screen multiplayer, on GBA, everyone would have their own screen. In Super and 64, you could see what items people had, resulting in, as Takeshi Ando puts it, pressure and bargaining amongst combatants. At one point, the team wanted to maintain this aspect of multiplayer, and even tried squeezing all four players' point of view onto the Game Boy Advance screen. The GBA's resolution is only 240 by 160 pixels, so each player's chunk of the screen would render gameplay with just 120 by 80 pixels. That's half as many pixels as an OG Game Boy game, which sounds horrible and is probably 
probably why the idea was dropped. They ultimately let each player enjoy their whole screen, and flipped the script by letting players take advantage of what others couldn't see. The resulting lack of screen sniping and bargaining changed the balance of the game, so the team altered the appearance rate of items to compensate. Each player using their own GBA in multiplayer led to another issue, one that Matsumoto says was the hardest part of developing the game's multiplayer. Multiplayer was achieved in past Mario Kart games by plugging up to four controllers into a single console, meaning all the player inputs were sent to a single system. But if a multiplayer setup uses two or more handheld consoles, every participating device will receive user input, and all those inputs need to be synced up. The team struggled to get all the GBAs communicating with the right timing, and this struggle continued late into development. In fact, they were troubleshooting it all the way into the debugging stage. Despite this, the team decided to expand multiplayer further in late 2000 by adding support for the Mobile Adapter GB. This Japan-exclusive device would link the GBA to a cell phone and use the phone's wireless capabilities to play with others or even download new data for games. For example, Mario Kart players could download ghost data of the 10,000 fastest racers using the service. They were ranked on both national and regional leaderboards, where top players could earn titles like Kyoto Prefectural Champion. There were also ranked time trial contests and regular mobile GP tournaments held by Nintendo. These could have all kinds of custom rules that challenge players, like limiting the number of coins you can collect, maybe having only mushrooms appear for items, or even making it so players can only enter the tournament as Luigi. The interview ends with the team letting everyone know that a new tournament was underway titled Mario Kart Advance GP 2001, and that the finals would take place at Space World 2001. Mario Kart games weren't originally intended to be played on a handheld, but the next series we're looking at was born on and refined for handheld. Let's dive back into the same issue of Nintendo Online Magazine for another interview we had translated. This one's for a game fans still hope will get a true sequel someday, Wario Land 4. The interview features such developers as the game's director Hirofumi Matsuoka, designer Takehiko Hosokawa, and programmer Goro Abe. Near the start of the interview, Matsuoka reveals that early on, the team decided Wario Land 4 should be designed for playing in short bursts, seemingly to capitalize on the GBA's portability. But some balance issues had to be addressed as well. Takehiko Hosokawa had played a key role in the development of every Wario Land up to this point. And while looking back at the series he helped create, Hosokawa realized the series had adopted what he believed to be a design flaw. With the exception of Wario Land 3's final boss, not a single enemy in Wario Land 2 or 3 can defeat Wario and trigger a game over. Enemies in those games just temporarily impede Wario's progress. It might seem like Wario's near godlike immortality would have few downsides, but Hosokawa came to see it as a huge disadvantage. Simply put, if Wario can't die, the game has no stakes and no real sense of urgency. So Hosokawa began thinking about how he could add that missing sense of urgency, and decided to tinker with Wario Land 3. He ended up adding a countdown to the game, which forced him to beat it within a time limit, and it worked. Hosokawa had found that missing sense of urgency, and the team decided to insert a time limit into every level of Wario Land 4. It's kind of funny, they ended up slapping a health bar on Wario in the final game anyway, but yeah. In early builds of the game, a countdown would be triggered as soon as Wario entered a level, and you'd have to collect treasure within the time limit. This would be expanded upon with the Switch system in the final game. The team wanted to cram as many stages into the game as possible, but ended up having to reel in their expectations in order to hit deadlines. When development first started, the team looked at Wario's movement in Wario Land 2 and 3 on the Game Boy, and recreated it on GBA as a starting point. As work progressed, the team were surprised by how much detail they could squeeze into the GBA's graphics compared to Game Boy Color, and took every advantage of this while animating Wario. 
The team gave Wario almost twice as many frames of animation for his GBA debut than in Wario Land 3, letting them work far more character into his movements and mannerisms. In Wario Land 3, if you leave the game alone for long enough without pressing a button, Wario will kind of just fall asleep or scratch his ass if you're on a ladder. But in Wario Land 4, he'll do things like pump dumbbells or jump rope. According to Hosokawa, these idle animations were never actually planned. The animators just threw them in for the fun of it. You can see the various quirks of the staff and the graphics they created. Like the dumbbell and jump rope, those weren't ordered by the director, but came from the staff drawing Wario thinking that, instead of standing still, it would be better if he was doing something, then putting that in. He also implies the game originally had even more animations and content that were cut, saying, We made the game by packing in a ton of different elements and then shaving off what was unnecessary at the end. You can tell the team had a lot of fun making Wario Land 4. They even put themselves into the game's sound room in full Wario cosplay and all. Matsuoka says this was to demonstrate as creators what's possible on the advance. Another point brought up in the interview is that Wario Land 4's bosses all have, in the dev's own words, grotesque designs. This was apparently done because Wario is pretty popular in the United States, and the devs wanted to make the game seem more American. They even gave Wario an American-looking car. Goro Abe says this stateside cultural pivot was to change Wario's image. According to Abe, earlier games in the series gave the impression that they were just for dedicated fans. They saw this as an issue and wanted to give Wario more mass appeal. A slightly Americanized Wario would be more relatable to Westerners, and Japanese people tend to see American things as kinda cool. On paper, it's a win-win. Another way they made the game feel more American was by regularly using audio samples of people talking and singing in English. That doesn't seem too strange today, but Hosokawa recalls there were some concerns that Wario Land 2 and 3 veterans might feel weird about the music. And this sentiment was echoed by Nintendo's own Mario Club playtesters when they were checking the game. But in the end, Wario Land 4's audacious soundtrack was well received. With the conversation winding down, the interviewer asks, what appeal does Wario have that Mario doesn't? Matsuoka reckons Wario's mischievous nature is something he has over Mario. He's rare for a Nintendo character in that he's wild. Even the game manual is a bit questionable, but because it's Wario, it's okay. We don't recall Wario Land 4's manual saying anything too risque, so we checked the Japanese game manual. And yeah, it, it goes a bit harder than the North American and European booklets. Besides Wario's diary entry going into gross detail about his boogers and mentioning poop, the Japanese manual also has Wario saying he's gonna crap his pants from a fear of heights. Did you also know that Nintendo actually used elephant sounds for the seagulls in Wind Waker? Or that Miyamoto says Captain Olimar's wife is abusive? For more info, check out our last video on new GameCube game facts. Special thanks to Jacob Newcomb for translating Japanese text, as well as Seikei for additional fact-checking, and to Sankui for explaining GBA hardware to us like we're five. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.